Hello there, it's Declan Costello here, ENT consultant at Wexham Park Hospital in Slough in Berkshire uh, and also in London. Um, this is the second of a series of lectures um, and this one is going to be on the subject of uh, laryngeal surgery and on uh, laryn and voice clinics as well and, that, and what happens in voice clinics and how they generally work. So uh, let me just go to here and I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see what's going on. Good, I hope you can see that. I introduced you last time to St Blaise, the patron saint of throats. Um, I hope you uh, keep St Blaise in your minds as we, uh, as we go along. Um, so let's talk then about uh, laryngeal pathology and how we diagnose problems in the larynx. Pathology just means disease really and things that can go wrong. <clears throat> so um, what are the different ways in which we decide what is wrong with someone's voice? Well the first thing to, is that the, the patient can tell us. Um, the, uh, there are various questionnaires that patients can fill in to tell us what they think of their own voices. VHI stands for the Voice Handicap Index and the Voice Handicap Index is a series of questions um, relating to different aspects of the voice. So my voice makes me feel uh, depressed, my voice uh, causes me to, to lose income, um, I can't uh, raise my voice in a crowded space, so various different uh, domains in which the voice can be a problem. And then each of those things is given a score and you tot up the score. Um, there, are, uh, there are two VHIs uh, in widespread use. One is the VHI 30, which is 30 questions, which is quite bulky. And then there's another called the VHI 10, where it's all been pared down and shortened into just a 10 question uh, questionnaire, which actually is very much easier for patients to, uh, to fill in. So the VHI is quite a useful thing uh, if you are dealing with somebody who is perhaps not a professional voice user in the sense of being a singer or an actor or a, you know, a, a, a musical theatre performer. Um, but for uh, people in a variety of different occupations, it gives us a very broad idea as to how handicapped, VHI, handicapped, how handicapped the person feels, uh, feels about their voice. <clears throat> so the second uh, way we can diagnose pathology or listen to uh, or hear a problem in a patient's voice is actually by us listening to the, the voices ourselves. Now, um, we uh, there is a system called Grabas G R B A S, which is um, a system in which we, the clinicians, by which I mean ENT surgeons and speech and language therapists, we will listen to a person's voice and we will give the voice a, a grade, a score in a number of different areas. Now, um, in this G R B A S, um, R stands for the roughness of the voice, B stands for the breathiness of the voice. A stands for the asthemia of the voice, which is um, a, a quite slightly difficult concept to put across, but it's, it's to do with sort of weakness and feebleness of voice, if you like. And S is the strain in the voice. So for each of those, for the roughness, breathiness, asthemia and strain, we give the voice a, a mark of zero to three. And then we come back to the G, which is the overall grade and decide overall how bad do we think their voice is out of three. So for, for each of those areas, G, R, B, A and S, each of those will have a number of 0, 1, 2 or 3. And that's quite useful for us because it means that from one visit to the next in clinic, we can uh, uh, listen to the patient's voice and decide amongst ourselves whether we think things are getting better. Now the key part of any um, consultation with an ENT surgeon who is going to talk about your voice is the video stroboscopy, laryngostroboscopy. In other words, looking at the larynx, looking at the vocal cords with this technique called stroboscopy. And if you want a, a definition of stroboscopy, then maybe just hop back to the previous lecture uh, because I defined it there. But stroboscopy essentially is a means of looking at the vocal cords when they're moving, when they're vibrating, but looking at the moving in slow motion. So rather than moving 150 times a second so you can't see them, you can see them gliding smoothly together. <clears throat> so laryngostroboscopy, video stroboscopy, laryngo video stroboscopy, whatever you want to call it, but the stroboscopy bit is absolutely critical, particularly perform for performers who need to have their larynx examined. And then there's a whole series of specialist uh, tests that can be done to analyse 
uh, different parameters in the voice. Now, the truth is that actually these tests are quite time consuming, they're quite expensive, they require specialist bits of kit and often special uh, soundproof rooms and so on. And actually, they don't really make a great deal of difference, in my opinion, to what you do uh, with the patient in the longer term. So w in my practice, we tend not to uh, do very much in the way of specialist tests. Glottography uh, is, it can be useful, but again, not in all that widespread use. Glottography is when you um, plot out how much of the time the vocal cords are closed. And that can be quite a useful thing in a number of different scenarios, but again, not in, in all that widespread use. <clears throat> so um, with thanks to Julian McGlashan for his um, uh, excellent classification system of problems with the voice. Um, there are really four broad areas where the voice can go wrong. There are inflammatory things, uh, neoplastic or structural things, and that, by that I mean lumps and bumps and growths, muscle tension imbalance, and neuromuscular problems. So almost all voice problems, all voice problems really, will fall into one uh, or perhaps more of these categories. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I say more of these categories because it's very often the case that um, a problem in one area can lead to a knock-on effect in a different area. So, for example, if you've got a lump on one of the vocal cords, let's say you've got a polyp on one vocal cord, um, there is a natural tendency when you've got a husky voice to try and hold the larynx quite tight and strained. So that lump, the, the, the neoplastic or the lump sitting on the vocal cord, can cause a secondary problem of muscle tension imbalance <clears throat> and the, uh, the it's all very well to remove the polyp and a surgeon can remove a polyp like that relatively straightforwardly but um, it's then going to lead to, you then need a speech and language therapist to help to undo the muscle tension that has crept in the um, the reverse can also be true so if you are using the muscles of your larynx in slightly the wrong way that can lead to lumps and bumps on the vocal cords. And the classic example of that is vocal cord nodules, which occur when you uh, are using the, the voice in a particularly strained and tight and overexertional way. And, the, uh, and that leads to these swellings on the vocal cords. And if you follow on to the next lecture, you'll see some videos of patients with uh, nodules. <laughs> and then eventually they can all be connected to each other uh, in slightly uh, complicated and unhelpful ways. <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the neoplastic things. I've talked about nodules and I'm going to talk about those in quite a lot more detail in the next lecture. A uh, and nodules always happen as a result of long-term voice misuse. They, they don't come up overnight, for example. Um, and almost always the treatment for nodules is voice therapy or altering how the voice is used. The second uh, problem that quite frequently crops up is uh, polyp. A polyp is a swelling on the surface of the vocal cord and all, it is always just on one side. So a polyp is unilateral on one side, nodules are bilateral and that is a key difference between the two. Now the other key difference between nodules and polyps is that polyps um, come up as a result of a single episode of trauma, phonotrauma to the larynx. <clears throat> and that can be a big yell or a big shout or a big cough. Um, uh, so that's another key uh, key issue. Reinke's edema is a condition where you get swelling of the undersurface of the vocal cord, or rather swelling of the, the layer just below the surface of the vocal cord. Um, and we'll see some videos of that as we go along. And if you're uh, watching the previous lecture, you'll know that Reinke's space is the space just under the surface, and a cyst is a pocket of fluid within the vocal cord. Now, there are various inflammatory things that can happen to the larynx. I don't usually get to see viral or bacterial laryngitis in my clinic because by the time the patient gets to come and see me, uh, they've almost always, it's almost always resolved of its own accord. I do, however, see a fair amount of fungal laryngitis and fungal laryngitis, in other words, thrush on the vocal cords. That can happen uh, if a patient is on uh, inhaled steroids. So patients who have asthma are quite frequently on steroids to try to control the asthma. And if you are on those, then that can leave you prone to thrush of the larynx and also thrush of the mouth. Uh, anybody who has asthma will be familiar with the fact that that, uh, that can uh, happen from time to time. <clears throat> 
So there are infectious causes of laryngitis. And then there are some non-infectious non causes of laryngitis as well. Reflux is a huge topic. I will cover reflux in the next lecture, so I'm not going to go into it in any detail now. Suffice to say that reflux is quite a controversial topic, and we don't we don't really have a particularly good handle on it at this stage. And allergies, you know, it's conceivable that an allergy that affects your nose and your lungs may very well affect your larynx as well. So there are some neuromuscular <clears throat> problems that can um, happen to the larynx as well. Um, if you were watching the previous lecture, you'll know that a nerve palsy is where one of the nerves to the voice box has stopped working, and that will give you a paralysis of uh, one of the vocal cords. Um, I'm going to show you videos of that um, in the next lecture, but um, vocal cord paralysis or, or uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy uh, is something I spend quite a lot of my time uh, dealing with and helping patients with. Now, spasmodic dysphonia is a very unusual condition. Spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological condition. Um, uh, it's one of a group of disorders called dystonias, and dystonias are where you get abnormal muscle contraction in a particular part of the body. So, for example, writer's cramp is where you get cramping of the forearm muscles, and that causes the hand to go into spasm. Um, in spasmodic dysphonia, you get spasms of the muscles within the larynx, within the voice box. And that gives you a, a very characteristic and very unusual sounding voice. Uh, there are two types of spasmodic dysphonia, but in the more common type, uh, which is called adductor spasmodic dysphonia, um, you end up with a very staccato and broken up sounding voice. So it's, it's a bit it's with a, it's got to, so the voice is constantly breaking up and the patient can't get it through a whole sentence without this very sort of choppy staccato sound. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it now is that, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's extremely rare, but actually we have some really good treatments to help to control it. And that principally involves injecting Botox into the vocal cords, which is not as bad as it sounds. Uh, we inject a needle directly through the skin and into the vocal cords, but actually it's, it's really extremely well tolerated. It's really not a major problem to have to have it done. And the, um, uh, the results are absolutely fantastic. And then there are behavioural things, by which I mean, there's, you know, if your lifestyle uh, is not uh, in keeping with looking after your voice. So if you're out at nightclubs four nights a week, and if you're vo by vocal hygiene, we mean the way in which you're looking after your voice in general. So, so that would be, be things like drinking plenty of water, not drinking too much caffeine, not smoking, uh, all these sorts of things. And so lifestyle and vocal hygiene are a big issue. <clears throat> and muscle tension dysphonia is something I see a huge amount of in my clinic. So the commonest of these, when a singer comes to see me in uh, my clinic, you know, I want to be able to give them an answer as to exactly which of those categories do they fall into and how we're going to treat them. And the commonest amongst the singers I see actually the sort of muscle tension problems. Most of the time, much to the relief of the singer, I'm able to look at the vocal cords and say, actually, you don't have an intrinsic problem with the vocal cords themselves. No lumps, no bumps, no growths. Um, this is really probably to do with how you're setting yourself up from a muscular point of view to sing. And the solution for that is to uh, get some voice coaching, some singing teaching, and maybe also to have some speech therapy as well. The next commonest is probably neoplastic things, so lumps and bumps. Um, I reasonably frequently see uh, a polyp on one of the vocal cords in a singer, and that is, um, uh, well, we'll talk about that later on, but that's, that, again, that's probably the second commonest thing. And then inflammatory things as well, <clears throat> reflux being the main uh, inflammatory problem in singers. <clears throat> so um, what is a voice clinic? A voice clinic is um, uh, set up specifically to deal with uh, professional voice users. Now, what do I mean by professional voice users? Well, I really mean anybody who uses their voice uh, a lot for their job. Now, historically, that would have meant actors, singers, and that sort of thing. But actually, these days, pretty much everybody in society needs to use their voice to a reasonable extent. So if you're a call centre worker or a teacher, clergy, lawyer, um, uh, accountant, whatever, actually, you do almost everybody in society these days is using their voice uh, in, um, uh, in, in their work. But there are some other, uh, there are some clinics uh, that are specifically tailored to singers and performers. 
And, and when you go into a voice clinic, whether that's in the NHS or in the private sector, uh, you will be met with uh, an ENT surgeon and a speech and language therapist and a voice clinic, a multidisciplinary voice clinic. <clears throat> Those are the two sort of basic components of who needs to be there. Now, I've given you a list there of uh, a lot of other people who can be in these clinics as well. So you might have a singing teacher uh, or a voice coach in the uh, uh, in the voice clinic, an osteopath, a psychologist. You know, the, the psychology of performing is a huge thing. And actually, uh, to try to unpick some of the sort of psychological stresses that can contribute to voice problems is, is massively important. So when you go into a voice clinic, you will be met not just by the ENT surgeon, but probably by another few people as well. <clears throat> so when you are seen in a voice clinic, you know, what happens? Well, the first thing is that you will uh, speak to the clinician and they'll take a medical history from you. They will ask your presenting complaint. In other words, what brings you here today? What's the problem? They'll talk about your drug history, uh, by which I mean the, the medications you're taking at the moment, allergies, your vocal hygiene, as we were just saying a second ago about how you're looking after your voice. And they'll talk about your vocal history as well. And this, uh, this vocal history is sort of tailored according to the type of singer you are. Have you recently changed style of singing? Have you been uh, singing jazz in in your first term uh, at, uh, at college and now you're you've moved on to baroque opera which seems a bit um, implausible but you know um, who knows so have you suddenly changed styles um, what's your training have you been singing in pubs and clubs for all of your life and now at the age of 60 um, it's suddenly not working for you and do you perhaps just need some training what warm-ups and, and importantly, what cool downs are you doing as well? Schedule of performances and, and roles. Have you got, you know, nine months of wicked coming up? Um, and is that a really major, uh, major factor for you? Are there any specific demands in this role? Do you have to do an accent? Do you have to do a kind of funny voice? Do you have to do a, a, a nasally voice and those sorts of things? And psychological issues as well. But perhaps most importantly, why are you here now? Is it the fact that you've got one concert to do on Saturday and if you can get through Saturday then you've got three weeks off and you're absolutely fine or is this the start of your nine month contract in Wicked are you having problems now and how are you going to get through the next nine months because the two those two things the kind of one concert on Saturday versus the nine months of Wicked is actually of two very different situations <clears throat> So we've talked about uh, vocal hygiene a bit already. It really just refers to the way overall that the person is looking after their voice. So smoking and alcohol are very clear. Alcohol, I mean, smoking is self-evident. Um, it causes a, a huge range of problems. And in the next lecture, I'll show you some videos of larynxes that have been affected by alcohol. Um, uh, by smoking, I should say. Alcohol is, a, is an interesting one. I mean, why does alcohol cause voice problems? Well, uh, there are a few things, I think. Uh, first of all, alcohol tends to be associated with uh, places that are quite noisy. So, you, you know, bars, pubs, clubs tend to be pretty noisy. Secondly, alcohol is quite a potent disinhibitor. So you have a glass of wine and you get a bit more chatty. You have another glass of wine, you get a bit more chatty. And then actually uh, the whole thing escalates and, and your, your voice gets louder and louder. And you, use your, you end up using your voice for very long periods of time. The other thing about alcohol, of course, is that it, it's a diuretic. It dries you out uh, and you'll, you'll be aware of that, familiar with the idea that the morning after um, you've been out, your, your mouth does feel very dry. Throat clearing is problematic. Now, the problem with throat clearing is that every time you clear your throat, you're, <coughs> you're bashing the vocal cords together quite hard, which irritates them. And the more you irritate them, the more you want to clear your throat. Uh, so you're not only damaging your voice, but you're actually also perpetuating the problem abusive behaviors by that i mean you know yelling screaming raising your voice for prolonged periods hydration is really important i mean i'm i would recommend typically that people be drinking two to three liters of water per day which sounds like a huge amount it is a huge amount in fact uh, but it's necessary to keep the mucus nice and soft and supple so that you uh, so that it's, it's lining the vocal cords in a helpful way rather than thick dry sticky stuff that's not helpful and then steaming. Uh, steaming can be extremely useful just to sort of get a direct hit of moisture onto the vocal cords and treating reflux as well, uh, thinking about reflux. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. So the next step in the voice clinic is that you will be examined. Now, by examination, we will start with uh, feeling the neck. Are there any lumps and bumps? 
Is there any tenderness? Are we feeling any specific areas of muscular tension? And there are some sort of significant areas where tension can creep in. And there are people who specialize in just assessing muscular tension in the neck. And then we will go on and examine the larynx. And you'll see lots of videos of, of laryngeal examinations in a minute, and I'll show you how we do it. So when you get to the end of the voice clinic and you've decided what's wrong with the patient, a number of different things can happen. So you get to the final five minutes and what happens now? So the first thing is that you can do nothing. If, the, um, uh, if there is nothing wrong with the larynx and if the patient is happy to accept the fact that everything's absolutely tickety-boo, great. You leave it at that and you don't have any further uh, input. Very often with singers, I'm suggesting that they're going to go for some voice coaching or, or uh, singing teaching. Um, to, uh, to try to optimise their vocal technique. If I identify a specific problem with the patient's speaking voice, if I think that there is a certain way about, a certain thing about the way they're using their speaking voice that I think uh, could be improved on, then I will refer them to a speech and language therapist. And then there's medical treatment, in other words, non surgical things. So that might mean uh, tablets, antibiotics or antifungals, steroids, and then long-term uh, treatments such as anti-reflux. So how do we examine the larynx? Um, this is uh, Manuel Garcia. Manuel Garcia invented the laryngoscope uh, in 1841, and this is how he did it. So let me just talk you through this um, uh, this photograph. So he's got an oil lamp in front of him, which is uh, burning away with a slightly dim flame the light of the oil lamp is coming off his head mirror being reflected into a mirror in his hand and that's being reflected into a mirror in the back of his throat so the stick he's holding has got an angled mirror on on the end of it like that he's put it in his mouth and he's looking at a mirror in his hand to look into the back of his throat but the light is coming from here onto here onto here and then directly into his mouth. So the amount of light that was actually getting into his throat, I would suggest, uh, was probably pretty limited. Uh, I don't quite know how good a view he got, but I'm guessing it wasn't all that good. Anyway, he's been credited with, you, with inventing the first laryngoscope, and if you saw one of his laryngoscopes now, you would probably think of it as being a dental mirror. It's the kind of mirror that dentists use all the time for looking at teeth. So this is uh, Manuel Garcia examining another patient. Again, the oil lamp in the middle, the mirror on his head reflecting light into the patient's mouth. And the patient's got this 45 degree angled uh, um, uh, mirror uh, and Garcia is looking in and downwards towards the vocal cords. And that's roughly the sort of view you get in an ideal world. This is me trying to examine my larynx for a Radio 3 program a few years ago. Um, it's it's not the easiest thing to do you know so I've got my this is my shaving mirror from home I've got a head torch on I've got light going into here and I've got my, uh, my dental mirror in my hand and I'm looking over the back of my tongue and down at my larynx it didn't make for brilliant radio I have to say because all you can hear me say is as I'm, as I'm holding my own tongue out um, but um, it, you do get a view, but really not a particularly good view. And, and this is the way that vocal cords were being examined until probably about 30 or 40 years ago. Now, 30 or 40 years ago, what happened was that we developed um, fiber optics. Incidentally, this is the, um, the, the Radio 3 program that that, that um, uh, examination happened on. So 30 or 40 years ago, or maybe more than that now, we developed fiber optics and fiber optics are uh, lengths of cable that can transmit light and that means that they can, and they're flexible so you could put you can put one of these through the nose look through the nose and down at the back of the throat and down at the vocal cords which makes a huge difference the next step on from that was um, uh, chip tip endoscopy now a chip tip endoscope is where you have a flexible endoscope so it's about the size of a boot lace or, or electric flex um, but a tiny camera is mounted on the end of it. And that means that you could, uh, with a high enough quality camera, you can get fantastic images of the vocal cords. Now, this is my friend Nigel examining me. Uh, here he goes into my nose. Um, it looks pretty grim, isn't it? Uh, very often you will have a little bit of local anaesthetic to make the nose and throat go a bit numb as you're doing this. So this is a flexible endoscope that's now in my nose. Nigel is now going to turn the endoscope so it's facing downwards and he's going to advance over the back of my uh, 
uh, soft palate and have a look at my uh, pharynx and larynx. So let's just give you a guided tour here. So that's the epiglottis. These are the vocal cords just coming into view in the distance and at the bottom of the image here, which is at the front. So that this is the front part of the larynx and this is the back part of the larynx. At the front here, actually, this is my tongue. So as he goes in, you can see the vocal cords. As I'm breathing nice and quietly, the vocal cords are apart. And when I say he, 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 the vocal cords come together. And that gives you, you know, th this flexible chip tip endoscope gives you a really nice view of the vocal cords. Um, and it means that you can, you can, when you've got the endoscope in, you can sing and speak and do anything you need to do. You can do a glissando. Um, and it's very useful because it means that if somebody's having a problem with a particular part of their range or with a particular song, you can go through it and actually pinpoint precisely what's going on at any given time. So I find the flexible chip tip endoscopy really good. And this has now really superseded the fiber optic endoscopy. So fiber optic endoscopes are still in quite widespread use in sort of generally NT clinics, but there is no place for fiber optic endoscopy in a voice clinic. Chip tip endoscopy, these very high tech digital chips on the end of flexible scopes are the way forward. Now, the other way of looking at the larynx in a voice clinic is with a rigid endoscope. So that's what you see in this image on the right. This is uh, somebody who's got, he's got his tongue held out. Uh, he's got a rigid tube, a rigid rod sitting on his tongue. And at the end of here is an angled prism that's pointing downwards towards his vocal cords. Um, and that's giving the, uh, the doctor a view of his larynx. It, it looks awful. It's not actually as bad as it looks. And, and most singers actually get on fine with this. And, and the advantage of doing the rigid uh, stroboscopy is that um, a rigid laryngeal examination is you get really beautifully clear images of the edges of the vocal cords. Now, um, th the trouble is that that is at the expense of being able to do anything in terms of singing or anything like that. Because by the time you've got somebody holding your tongue out, is the only noise you can make. You can and stretch a bit, but you can't, you couldn't meaningfully sing anything uh, at that stage, but it's, um, it's a nice tool. But the key thing for all of this for, for singers is that stroboscopy is mandatory. In other words, that business of looking at the vocal cords moving in slow motion to get a clear idea of the surface lining of the vocal cords, that stroboscopy is absolutely mandatory. You must insist on that. Where do we think laryngeal imaging is going in the coming years? Well, um, high speed video footage, in other words, uh, not stroboscopy, but actually genuinely taking 20,000 frames a second um, is, is certainly there, but um, is enormously expensive. And actually, as you can imagine, in terms of computer processing power, uh, vastly uh, 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 computer intensive. Um, 3D imaging of the larynx uh, is uh, available and coming through. We do do high resolution CT and MRI scanning, which is useful. Uh, and that is helping us to treat vocal fold scarring. Um, uh, and the laryngeal examinations we do are certainly making a difference there. Um, and, you know, that in terms of developing voice clinics in general, I think it's true to say that medics, ENT surgeons do have an increasing uh, understanding of performing practices and how uh, performers work um, and you know, performers and medics uh, performers and ENT surgeons are talking better performers and speech and language therapists performers and their um, uh, voice coaches and their uh, massage therapists um, and their psychologists so actually as teams I think we're working rather better than we used to <clears throat> so let's just move on to the topic of surgery in singers operations on vocal cords and um, I guess I would say that if you can possibly avoid an operation on a singer, then uh, you would. This is Julie Andrews, of course, who um, had surgery on her larynx a number of years ago. And um, I don't know the ins and outs of what was done or who did it or how it was done. But suffice to say that she has not had a workable singing voice since that time. It's been a bit of a calamity for her. Somebody once said that good surgeons know how to operate. A better surgeon knows when to operate, but the best surgeon knows when not to operate. Now, sometimes you absolutely have to operate on somebody. You really haven't got very much choice. But that decision not to operate is sometimes 
as difficult, if not more difficult, than the decision to go ahead and operate. So when you, uh, when I'm seeing a patient in clinic, I want to know um, what sort of decision are you going to make? Uh, what do you want as a patient out of this consultation? Do you want to be reassured that everything's okay and then you head off into the sunset? That's fine. Do you want some immediate advice of what you to do to today? Um, do you want to know whether it's okay to go ahead with the performance tonight or tomorrow? Do you want some emergency treatment to get me through this show tonight or tomorrow? Now, um, the uh, the commonest thing that one can give to get somebody through a performance in the next day or two is steroids. And um, I do occasionally prescribe steroids for patients who need to get through a performance, but only with a fairly tightly constrained set of circumstances. So if there's only one or two shows to get through, fine. If when you look at the larynx, it's not pink and red and angry and inflamed, okay, that's okay. Um, and it really has to be a limited number of performances that the person wants to get through. If this is that situation we were talking about before, if this is the beginning of a nine month run of Wicked, a set of steroids now and tomorrow is not going to get you through the next nine months. Um, in the voice clinic, sometimes we're presented with terminally ill patients, for example, and you need a quick decision as to whether there's something you can do to help with their voice for the last few weeks of their life. And sometimes patients come for a second opinion. They'll say, you know, Mr. Bloggs up the road suggested I needed an operation on my vocal cords. I'm really just coming for a second opinion to decide whether that's, uh, whether that's really necessary. So, as I say, there, there are times when uh, you, I look at a larynx and I say surgery is obviously needed. If you're a singer and you've had a husky voice for nine months and there is a polyp sitting on the edge of the vocal cord, um, that is not going to go away of its own accord, I'm afraid. And surgery, therefore, is obviously needed in order to restore the uh, voice to where it started from. Sometimes surgery is obviously not needed, you know, so if the, if the patient has nothing uh, ostensibly wrong with their vocal cords and there are no lumps or bumps or growths or anything, that's great. You, obviously, you don't obviously need surgery. Sometimes you, we're in a situation where the vocal cords look a little bit inflamed, maybe a bit red. Uh, you think there might be an underlying problem, but everything looks a bit inflamed and irritated. So you want to try and settle that down before deciding whether this person's going to need an operation. And uh, very often that will involve some anti-reflux treatment, it will involve some voice therapy to reduce the collision forces on the cords, and then we might see somebody six weeks or so later to, to decide what we're going to do. Um, so when you, we treat you, what do you want to achieve out of this? So to, for different people, the outcome will be or their desired outcome will be different so for example do you want to have a smoother voice do you want to have a voice that's higher in pitch um, do you want to have a lower voice do you want to have a less breathy voice i've put here um uh, uh, a horse pubophonic so pu pubophonia is a very unusual condition in which uh, an adolescent boy a boy whose voice is breaking doesn't tap into his male chest modal register and he continues to speak in a falsetto voice after his voice is broken and it gives a very characteristic falsetto sound of voice. Now I have seen patients in the past and incidentally most people will come to the clinic, most people who have pubophonia will come to the clinic and say well you see the thing is my voice never broke. Well actually their voice did break it's just that actually they're not using the muscles in the, in the right sort of coordinated way to uh, to make the voice work in the lower modal register <clears throat> but i have been in situations where i've seen a patient who has had a, a pubophonic voice or a, 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 a falsetto sounding voice excuse my daughter shouting in the background um so a pubophonic voice but they are they are husky as well and actually they're not particularly interested in having the the pubophonia treated they don't want the pitch to come down they just want the hoarseness addressed do you want a lower voice? Do you want the pitch to come down? <clears throat> Do you want a less breathy voice? And we'll see in the next lecture, we'll see some situations where the voice is breathy uh, and patients can have that addressed. Do, so, as I say, the key thing is that you, uh, for me as a clinician, I need to ask the patient, what is it specifically about your voice 
that is the problem. I may have a different view on what's wrong with the patient's voice than the patient does. And for example, if I've not met him, but if Rod Stewart came through the door and said, I want, uh, I, you know, I, I'm bothered about this particular aspect of my voice, but I don't want you to make it crystal clear. Because listen, if I made Rod Stewart's voice crystal clear, um, he would sue the backside of me because that his his whole thing is of not having a particularly uh, pure, clear tone. So that's what I mean about what do the patient want? Do they want more stamina? Do they want more range? Um, and, and you need to tailor your treatment exactly to that. So in order to make a decision, you really do need to have an accurate diagnosis. And that's where this stroboscopy comes in. Uh, that gives the best possible evaluation of the mucosal surface, in other words, the lining of the vocal cords and whether there are any lumps and bumps, whether there's any tethering or scarring or what have you. Um, flexible endoscopy, uh, by which I mean either the fiber optic or chip tip, does provide it really useful dynamic information, by which I mean information about what's actually going on when the patient is singing. And you might find that there are certain muscular tension patterns uh, that need to be unlocked in order for the voice to come back. And with a flexible endoscope, because you can sing and speak and do everything else with those in, uh, with the endoscope in, then uh, you can decide what sort of muscle tension problems there might be. So when would you not operate? Well, um, you can ask the patient, you know, could, could the patient manage uh, working around a lesion. So it's, you can have a lump or a bump on the vocal cord as long as you're happy that it's not um, malignant, that it's not a cancer, it's perfectly okay to leave these things alone. Just because you have a swelling on one of the vocal cords does not mean that you have to remove it. Um, so you could ask whether the patient can work around the uh, problem with some voice therapy um, or, some, or some vocal coaching. Um, and you know, many of these uh, benign non-cancerous problems will uh, the, the voice quality will improve with voice therapy and when you look down with the endoscope a few months later the, the lump or the bump may still be there but the um, uh, the voice might very well be better and, and actually if you can work around a problem without necessarily having to have an operation then that's great so be it had they had adequate medical therapy, PPIs are proton pump inhibitors, which are anti-acid medications. So do you need to treat the uh, vocal, uh, the, the laryngeal reflux? Do you need to give them some vocal hygiene advice as well? Managing patients' expectations is a really important aspect of this. If you see somebody with an absolutely terrible sounding voice, and if they expect that you're going to give them back a completely normal voice, then you need to talk about whether that's realistic or not. Because in the in the vast majority of cases, if somebody's voice is terrible to start with, you know, very husky or very breathy or whatever else it is, you're almost never going to give them back a completely normal voice afterwards. So under for the patient to understand what can and cannot be achieved is a huge part of it. And then, you know, how much of, a, of an improvement can you expect to get? How much of an improvement do you want to get? <clears throat> so when you've decided that you're going to operate or do something, there's a number of different ways in which you can treat the same problem. So, for example, with a vocal fold paralysis, if, if a patient has a paralyzed vocal fold, there's a raft of different ways that this that can be treated. Excuse the shouting off. Um, uh, there's a raft of different ways in which that can be treated. Now, you can give the patient voice therapy. Um, there are, a patient can have an injection into the vocal cord under local anaesthetic, LA, or under general anaesthetic, GA, while they're asleep. A thyroplasty is an operation where you make an incision in the neck and put an implant in from the outside. There are other various different operations that can be done. But this, and these are all just to treat one condition. So there's a variety of different approaches uh, for any one condition. And the decision as to exactly what you do from a surgical point of view depend, depends on the surgeon's experience, on the equipment, on the facilities, uh, on the hospital, on the anaesthetist and so on. Surgeons uh, really do need to be aware of their own limitations. There, you know, there are certain situations where we really can't get things very much better. Vocal cord scar is a classic example, going back to Julie Andrews for a second. <clears throat> the primary problem with her larynx, as I understand it, is that the vocal cords are very scarred. And trying to improve scar is very problematic. Trying to get rid of scar is very problematic. In fact, it's really impossible. We can try to make the situation better, 
Um, but, you know, as a surgeon, you need to be reasonably self-aware and say that there are some things we can do and there are certainly quite a lot of things that we can't do. And, you know, a surgeon needs to have the insight to know when to ask for help or when to seek a second opinion. And um, uh, we all, uh, as ENT surgeons, we all work with other people all the time uh, and we can, we can easily seek a second opinion if necessary. And it's perfectly OK for the patient to go and seek a second opinion themselves if they're not comfortable with what their surgeon has told them. By all means, go and get another opinion. I think that's an extremely sensible idea. So when are you going to operate on a patient? Well, uh, we've already talked about medical management, treating reflux and so on. Um, uh, it might have to work around the patient's schedule. They may say, look, I've got this run of operas that finishes in three weeks time. I can't afford not to finish this run of shows. Uh, we'll get to the end of that and then uh, we, can, we can have the operation at that stage. Um, and they need the, the patient then needs to understand when is it realistic to go back to voice usage and performing. Don't imagine that you're going to go back to performing a week later. It's going to be a number of weeks before you go back. And there are various different surgical approaches as well. Um, the, the surgeon will talk about whether a laser is going to be needed. Cold steel just means steel instruments to remove uh, lumps and bumps. Uh, a microdebrider is a cutting device for removing things. So there's a variety of different ways from a physical point of view of, of, of dealing with things and then how you manage the patient post-operatively. Perfection is the enemy of good. In other words, if you have a, a good outcome from a particular intervention, whether it's surgery or therapy or whatever else, if the thing is good now, think very carefully about whether you try to go to the next step to aim for perfection because you may find that actually in trying to go for a perfect result, you're actually undoing things a bit and you're making things uh, potentially worse. So this is how laryngeal surgery is done. Um, if you're operating directly on the vocal cords, um, the patient is asleep, obviously. Uh, this is The patient is lying down flat uh, with the neck extended and the surgeon is up at the top end and has inserted a laryngoscope, a metal tube that holds the mouth open, um, and this the metal laryngoscope is held onto the operating table with a series of sort of jigs and um, uh, levers and things, so that the whole thing is held stationary in place, and that means that the surgeon's got two hands free to operate. So here's the surgeon operating uh, with uh, the uh, looking down a microscope, so they're looking directly in a straight line of sight all the way down here and to the vocal cords uh, at around the level here. So we use a, 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 a microscope that can magnify to varying different degrees. Now, in terms of the actual instruments that you can get down the laryngoscope to operate on, you're obviously operating uh, through a relatively narrow tube uh, and you have long instruments that are about a foot long uh, that allow you to pick things up and cut them and move them apart and various other things. And Marc Boucherier, who was a, a, a laryngeal surgeon in Lyon, developed these really beautiful instruments that have got a handle at one end and at the far end they've got sort of grasping things and this and that. So, uh, you know, grasping things, scissors um, and, and various others. And this is what the end of them look like. They, this, these are sort of a couple of millimetres or so in size um, and you can you can pick things up move them around very delicately. These are crocodile forceps, um, scissors that are curved slightly to one side or curved slightly to the other, or in this case, these are scissors that are turned upwards. And this is the view you get. So you're looking through the patient's mouth directly down at the vocal cords off in the distance. And you can see immediately one of the, one of the problems here is that you've got a very limited amount of space through which you can operate. So you've got not very much movement of your hands. And the other problem, of course, is that you are uh, when you're looking down the laryngoscope, you're fulcruming here at the near end. So every small movement here is accentuated massively um, at the far end. Um, you'll see some laryngeal operations uh, as we go along. So when a patient has had to have surgery, what do you do next? Well, <clears throat> all laryngeal surgeons, I would say, advise a period of voice rest after an operation. Um, so um, I'm just going to ask this series of questions and we'll go through them one by one, but everybody advises voice rest. So why do we, why do we rest the voice? Well, we believe that if you 
rest the voice post-operatively, then um, scarring should be minimized if you uh, avoid post-operative trauma. Um, on the other hand, does voice rest itself lead to poor healing? There is an idea that in order for the vocal cord to heal properly, it needs to be remodeled. And as the as the, the healing layers are growing back, they need to be shaped properly. And that itself involves having to use the voice and having to bring the vocal cords together. So there is there is a balance between the two. Uh, on the one hand, you do want the uh, the surface lining to heal over, and on the other hand, and that takes a little bit of time. On the other hand, um, you do want the underlying layers to be remodeled. Does a failure to speak result in increased secretions and a desire to cough? If you can imagine, if you aren't using your voice at all, you're not allowed to cough or throat clear or whisper or hum or anything, um, then there is a possibility that secretions are going to accumulate uh, and cause uh, irritation. So prolonged voice rest, I would suggest, is uh, potentially deleterious. You know, if you don't use your voice for four weeks, if you completely not use your voice for four weeks, then clearly you're going to lose some muscle tone and some of your vocal fitness, so to speak. When can you go back to performing? Well, you need to allow um, time for the uh, uh, larynx to heal versus not um, giving it too much rest so that the muscles atrophy, so that the muscles become weak. In sports surgery, isometric exercise, if you've had an operation on a joint, then isometric exercises will start straight away. In other words, without moving the joint, uh, muscle strengthening can happen uh, even when the joint is kept uh, still. Um, so these are, the, I guess, the sort of guiding principles of surgery in singers uh, on the vocal cords. Avoid surgery unless strictly necessary. Minimally, minimal resection, in other words, remove as little as you need to when you're doing it, whilst accepting the fact that you do you are going to need to remove some uh, tissue very often. Avoid dissection at the free edge. So at, at the, where the vocal cords come together along their free edge, you need to try to avoid uh, too much dissection at that edge because that's the contact zone. That's the part where the vocal cords are coming together. And micro flaps means uh, it, sometimes we make incisions in the upper surface of a vocal cord and rather than making a big long incision you can just make a small incision. Um, meticulous technique stands to reason um, and uh, avoidance of intubation injury. So, so very often for these operations um, in order to get them done you have to have a breathing tube through the vocal cords to keep the patient breathing while the operation is being done. Um, you want to avoid any damage caused by the tube itself because that will clearly be a bit of a disaster. One option is to use jet ventilation, which is a technique where you don't put a tube down there at all, which is great if you can do that. There are technical problems with that. Or sometimes, Steve Zytel's in Boston, uh, always used to intubate the patients himself. He wouldn't even allow an anaesthetist to intubate the patient. He would have to do the intubation himself. So I'm just going to give you a quick survey of what um, uh, we do now, um, or this is now a, a paper that's quite a long time ago, but uh, in essence they sent out 7,300 uh, questionnaires of which about 1,200 responded. Uh, 51, only 51% 51 of people said that they, this is in America of course, but only 51% of surgeons said they were uh, recommending complete voice rest for an average in that survey of seven days, relative voice rest of, in 62%, and 15% said they would never recommend any voice rest at all, which is an interesting observation because actually I think the vast majority of us would say that uh, voice rest really is, rec is uh, required. Um, wound healing in the larynx has been studied in animals um, in, a, in a rabbit study going back to 2002 um, uh, they had a general anaesthetic biopsy of the vocal folds and the um, animals were then euthanized put down at 60 days and in areas of the vocal fold scar the, the collagen was laid down in a disorganized way and the vocal fold scar showed reduced elastin content. In other words, there was an increase in stiffness at the area where there was a scar. And you, this is intuitively the case. Scars are stiff. If you have a scar on your skin, uh, it feels stiff and firm. And the same is true on the vocal folds. <clears throat> so when you've had surgery on the larynx, the acute inflammatory phase, the immediate bit of inflammation, settles down after about day three. 
um, or starts to settle down uh, by day three and is completely settled by about day seven. And these data, they suggest, <clears throat> uh, provide support for mobilizing tissue after inflammation has subsided and the process of active tissue modeling has ensued. So some people would then use this as evidence to say, actually you should start using the voice after about day three. So looking at the uh, another animal study, in 20 dogs, um, they, th these dogs underwent phonomicrosurgery. Half of the dogs at the same time as the operation had um, a recurrent laryngeal nerve section. In other words, the nerve that moves the vocal cord was cut and that mimicked voice rest because with one vocal cord paralyzed, they weren't, the dogs weren't able to bring the vocal cords together, so they were effectively voice rested. Now, at the end of the, in the voice rest group, by the end of the week one, re-epithelialization re had happened. In other words, the surface lying of the vocal cord had completely healed over. By week two, the layers underneath had healed. Uh, and by week eight, there was a complete reformation of the basement membrane zone. In other words, the whole of the cover of the vocal cord had healed. In the non-voice rest group, the basement membrane was completely formed uh, by week four, but was disorganized. And, you know, uh, and there was ongoing disorganized healing, presumably because the dogs are barking and um, uh, their, their vocal cords are being bashed together. So there is definitely something about voice um, healing that requires some sort of voice rest afterwards. There are various other things that can be uh, thought about if you're thinking about laryngeal healing after after vocal cord surgery. Um, laser versus steel, you know, do you remove a particular thing using a laser or do you use steel instruments? And you know, in, in the right hands, either of those instruments is absolutely fine, but the person has to know how to use them and they have to know uh, the exact pros and cons of each of them. And, and every surgeon will have his or her own preference for, for what they do. Reflux um, can certainly have an effect post-operatively and some people will be put on anti-reflux treatment. Whispering, now whispering was previously thought to be uh, very problematic post-operatively because as you whisper, it's quite a tense posture, it's quite a tense sort of laryngeal posture, but some surgeons now actually are allowing some whispering uh, because at least then you're not getting the vocal cords to come together. Thinking about laser for a minute, I mean, if you use uh, a laser in the right way uh, and on the correct settings, then there's no particular reason to think it would be any worse. There aren't any histological studies and in um, uh, in laryngeal recovery terms, if you do it right, then there's no particular uh, advantage of one over the other. Reflux, well, there aren't really any studies of proton pump inhibitors or anti-acid medications in wound healing in the larynx. Um, it, there was a, a CAT study done looking at vocal cord scarring um, and um, the if you simulate reflux, in other words, if you drop pets of acid onto the vocal cords post-surgery, uh, it does cause uh, granulation formation, in other words, areas of uh, inflammation and irritation. Um, as I say, whispering usually results in compression of the anterior vocal folds, and we think therefore that it might be bad for laryngeal wound healing, but actually uh, I think some surgeons these days are allowing um, uh, whispering post-operatively. So Bob Satteloff uh, suggests two weeks of absolute voice rest. Wow, two weeks is a long time not to use your voice at all. He then examines them with a stroboscope and allows them to gently phonate for five to 10 minutes a day, building up over the period of a few weeks. And he would suggest resumption of performance of two to three months. Coulombo and Perouse, who are surgeons in Lyon, um, suggest four to seven days of absolute voice rest and again uh, examining them seeing how the larynx is healing and then three months off professional singing. Meredith Harries with whom I worked um, when I was a junior suggested two days of absolute voice rest followed by a week of sparing phonation and then gradually build up and that this is broadly speaking actually my regime what I would suggest is a couple of days of complete voice rest and then when I see patients I give them a, a sheet with exactly how much they're allowed to use their voice from one day to the next. I would see the patient at the two week stage and then if all's going well they can go back to using their voice norm uh, increasingly normally and back to performing at about six weeks post-operatively. Uh, six weeks is the very best that one can hope for I think in terms of getting back to performing. Um, so from the day of the operation to the day you go back to performing, if everything's gone smoothly, it would hopefully be six weeks. 
So surgery requires careful patient selection and a meticulous operative technique. The epithelium is formed by a week. Um, surgery on the free edge of the vocal fold, then voice rest is absolutely mandatory postoperatively. Uh, but I would not recommend long periods of voice rest because I think then you're into the realm of the, the underlying layers not healing up in quite the right way and voice rest uh, gradually building up. Return to performance after a couple of months, maybe even sooner than that, as I say, six weeks if things are going very well, and then consider anti-acid medications and perhaps antibiotics uh, if necessary. Um, there was a, a paper um, in 2017 that suggested that three days of voice rest is optimum, uh, but prolonged voice rest, in other words, seven days might be deleterious. Thank you very much indeed for your attention during this lecture. In the first of the lectures, I talked about vocal anatomy and physiology. In this lecture, I've talked about uh, voice clinics and uh, some vocal pathology and how laryngeal surgery is done and what we do after laryngeal surgery. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about vocal pathology and there'll be videos of lots of larynxes working well and working not so well. Thank you very much indeed for watching and I hope to see you next time.